When I was in Canada this summer on my sabbatical for the latter half, the solitude portion, I spent 15 days in quiet on the campus of the University of British Columbia. And I had a routine, every night I would walk out to the northernmost point of campus where there was a rose garden, this beautiful spot, it looks northwest into the mountains of British Columbia, and every night I would end my day watching the sunset right around 9.15. Remember when sunset was at 9.15? It was a long time ago. And uh, it was a beautiful little tradition I had. I'd go out there, I'd pray, and I'd thank God for a great day. And w- one time early on in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the time when I was out there, I had been reading the book of Deuteronomy that day, and I walked out to watch the sunset, and I pulled out a, a notepad, this notepad actually, and uh, here's what I wrote across the top of the notepad. In fact, this is actually the moment that I wrote it. Here's what I wrote. Reasons to devote an entire year to Deuteronomy. Because it's not exactly obvious, is it? No. I, I needed to pump myself up and get fired up. So I was like, why should we spend an entire year as a church studying Deuteronomy? And I just started making a list of things. So I wrote down things like, well, it's, it's an opportunity to go back and preach a book from the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. At our church, we preach the whole counsel of God. So sometimes we preach in the New Testament. Sometimes we go to the Psalms. Sometimes we go back to the, the Pentateuch. We want to preach the whole counsel of God. I also wrote down this. I don't know if you know this. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy more than any other book in the Old Testament. Did you know that? And he quotes it a bunch of times in the passage, the section of Deuteronomy we're about to study. So if Jesus loved Deuteronomy, we should love Deuteronomy. It's an opportunity to preach the Shema. The Shema is arguably the most important piece of liturgy for the people of Israel. This was a prayer that they loved. I have a friend in my church who uh, was raised in the, in the Jewish tradition. He, ta- he sang the Shema to me, and I got so emotional. It's this beautiful song, prayer. We're going to get to preach through the Shema in a few weeks. But right at the top of the list, here's what I wrote down. We get to preach the Ten Commandments. Isn't that amazing? See, if I was Pastor Charles, you'd be standing up giving me, amen, thank you. We, we get to preach the Ten Commandments. Did you know the Ten Commandments show up two times in your Bible? They show up in the book of Exodus in chapter 20, right at the original story where Moses tells the people of how God met the people, invited them into his presence on Mount Sinai, and he gave to them his, his law and the Ten Commandments. And then what happens is in Deuteronomy, this is now the second generation. Remember, they're standing at the boundary. They're at the eastern edge of the Jordan River. They're looking west into the promised land, waiting on bated breath for God to lead them in. And Moses says, let me remind you about one of the most important parts of our tradition, the Ten Commandments. And so, folks, we have an immense privilege over the next three months. If you're new, you chose a great Sunday to visit. We're going to take three Sundays. I said three months, three Sundays. I have a little bit of a head cold, so some stuff's going to come out, all right? Three Sundays, we're going to preach the Ten Commandments. It's going to be rich. So what happened was on Monday morning, I took the same notepad, I flipped the page, and I wrote down a new list. Reasons to devote three Sundays to the Ten Commandments. And this list was really interesting. It was actually a little bit jarring because I realized we have some challenges when it comes to the Ten Commandments. The first challenge that I wrote down is what I call the challenge of neglect. Increasingly, very few people in our culture are familiar with the Ten Commandments. A recent poll discovered that more Americans know the seven ingredients of a Big Mac than the Ten Commandments, all right? I shared that with my wife, and she was like, I don't know the seven, do you, she said, do you know the seven ingredients of a Big Mac? And I was like, I know them, because there was a song in the 80s. To all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame bun. Ah, but what are the Ten Commandments? Amen. Amen. Oh, man. 
That same study found that 12% of Americans believe Joan of Arc was Noah's husband, all right? <laughs> That's wrong, by the way. That's wrong. So we've got the challenge of neglect. So now look, if you don't know the 10 commandments, it's okay, I'm gonna put them up right now. I'm gonna give you a second. This is like my highly condensed version of the 10 commandments. We're gonna take two more weeks after this, we're gonna study these. I put them, I arranged them like this because in Jewish tradition, it's pretty much universally agreed that they were written on two tablets, front and back. The first five commandments were on one tablet. I'll explain why next Sunday. The last five on the second tablet. And for Christians even, so for, the, in, for our Jewish brothers and sisters, neglect of the 10 commandments is a great source of grief. But so it is for us as Christians as well. Because we know the Ten Commandments are absolutely critical to our life as believers. They're highly elevated in the scriptures. Did you know that the Bible teaches that the Ten Commandments were the only scripture inscribed by God himself on tablets of stone? And they're the only scripture that was placed in the Ark of the Covenant only the Ten Commandments. That, that, that wooden chest of acacia wood co co coated in gold. This is an important piece of scripture. So we want to take some time to study it. But that's, you can take that down. Thank you, Zach. That's just the, the first problem. The second problem is what I call the challenge of dread. And here's what I mean by that. We like the God of the New Testament around here, right? Christians, we, God of the New Testament is warm and forgiving and he's nice and he's squishy and he gives, he gives bear hugs. And we've been told the God of the Old Testament is mean. He's a God of vengeance. He has a God of all these rules. And if you break one of those rules, he's gonna smite you with a mighty smiting, right? I call this theology according to Harrison Ford, all right? Have you ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? My dad took me to that movie when I was eight years old. It scared the Ten Commandments right out of me, okay? <laughs> if you've seen the movie, by the end of the movie, they finally open the Ark of the Covenant and they dare to look upon the Ten Commandments and what happens? People's faces start melting off, right? That's what happens if you read the Bible, apparently, according to Harrison Ford. So we've got a problem of dread. But here's the main challenge and it's gonna surprise you what I'm about to say. So I'm gonna take the next 40 minutes to convince you that what I'm saying I think is true. My guess is that the vast majority of Christians, even really mature ones, don't really know why we have the 10 commandments in the first place. My guess is if I poll people to say, well, we go to the 10 commandments to find out what God requires of us, right? There are a list of demands, right? But what if I told you that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of the true meaning and the true beauty of the Ten Commandments? Did you know that the Bible actually never calls the Ten Commandments the Ten Commandments? That's not how the Bible refers to it. In the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew word to describe them, it's, it's the Hebrew word that it would be translated 10 words. So in the Greek translation, it's the Decalogue. So this morning, I'm gonna use the phrases Decalogue. If you hear me say Decalogue or 10 words, sometimes because I have a head cold, I'll mess up and I'll say the 10 commandments. But the reality is when we see 10 commandments, we immediately think a commandment and that causes us to step back on our heels and think this is a list of rules. Here is the problem. It's not just a list of rules. The 10 words are a revelation of the beauty and the glory and the care character of the living God. And if we think of them only as regulations, we miss all of the impact. For every commandment in the list of 10, there is a dozen portraits of how beautiful God is and how amazing his character is. 
And so my goal by the time you leave here is you will be so in love with the 10 words. You'll want to memorize them. You'll want to meditate on them. You'll, you will, you'll know them faster than you can list the seven ingredients in a Big Mac. Amen? Amen? See, if Pastor Charles were here, you'd stand up and give me a... Okay. <laughs> That's what I want. That's what, that's what we're doing for the next three Sundays. And I have a big task ahead of me, but I'm up to the task. So we grab your Bible and let's read now. Deuteronomy chapter five, new batteries. This is Jacob, everybody. Can we give Jacob a round? Thanks, bud. All right. Okay, here we go. I'm going to actually read to you starting in chapter 4, verse 44. I'm going to read you a little bit of an introduction. Here's what Moses says next. This is the law that Moses set before the people of Israel. Now, that word law, unfortunately, is not the best. That should really be Torah. That's the Hebrew word Torah. And I'm going to tell you in a minute, law is an unfortunate translation because it misses a bunch. This is the Torah that Moses set before the people. These are the testimonies. These are statutes and these are rules which Moses spoke to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt beyond the Jordan in the valley opposite Beth Peor in the land of Sihon, the king of the Amorites. Remember him from a few weeks ago? Who lived at Heshbon, whom Moses and the people of Israel defeated when they came out of Egypt and they took possession of his land and the land of Og, the king of Bashan. Remember him a couple weeks ago? These were the two kings of the Amorites who lived to the east beyond the Jordan from Aroer, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon as far as Mount Sirion, that is Hermon, together with all the Arabah on the east side of the Jordan as far as the Sea of the Arabah under the slopes of Pisgah. Here's what Moses is doing. He's saying, remember, here's where we are. We're, we're, we're in the plains of Moab. We talked about this several weeks ago. We've gathered as a people. We're waiting. We're at the boundary. We're a people at the boundary. There's the Jordan River. We're east of the, and we're waiting. And we're looking at the promised land. And Moses says, I want to remind you where we are. And he says, now, verse 44, look at your Bible. He says, now I'm going to introduce you to a brand new section in the book of Deuteronomy. When he says, this is the Torah, Moses is signaling, this is a new section and it's long. It stretches from chapter four, verse 44, all the way to the end of chapter 26. The problem is, when you hear law, you think, oh, we're gonna get a bunch of commandments and, and rules and a lists. But what's interesting is if you study what we're gonna do, the rest of Deuteronomy now, all the way through 26, we're not gonna get a bunch of rules. We're gonna get some prayers. We're gonna get testimonies of the story of God's faithfulness. We're gonna get recounting of how God showed up in their history. We're gonna get the 10 words, the Decalogue. And yes, we're gonna get some testimonies and commandments and rules. But, but to think of it as Torah strips it of the beauty. The Hebrew people, when they heard Torah, they heard wise instruction from our God. It was a beautiful concept. So we've got our work cut out for us. Let me keep reading. Now this next six verses, chapter five, this is the formal introduction to the Decalogue. And I'm gonna read it, and here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. While you're looking at your Bible, I want you to notice which words Moses repeats. Just pay attention. This is gonna be important. Moses summoned all Israel and he said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord, our God, made a covenant with us in Horeb, that's Mount Sinai. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today, the Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, while I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid of the fire and you did not go up into the mountain. So he said, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt 
out of the house of slavery. There are three words you have to understand in order to grasp the full beauty and the full power of the Decalogue. And you already know what the first one is, but I'm going to put the whole list up. Three words. You have to get these. The first is the personal name of God. Did you know that any time in your Bible, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is, in Hebrew, that is the personal name of the one and only creator, God. Some people think it would be pronounced Yahweh. The second word you have to know is the word covenant. And the third word, the word right before the 10 commandments begin, the 10 words is the word slavery. Yahweh is the source of the Decalogue. Covenant is the context. But slavery is the backdrop. Slavery is the story. And we need all three. So let's take a few minutes with each of these. Look back at verses one through six, and I want to show you. Six times in six verses, Moses uses the personal name of God in order to introduce the Decalogue. This is not an accident. Anytime you see that kind of repetition, especially in the Hebrew Bible, the author is alerting you to something. Moses is going out of his way to fix into the minds of the people of Israel the identity of the God who is the source of the 10 words. He wants to make sure they know. These did not simply come from human, this is not a synthesis of the best of human thinking about Exodus, about ethics. This isn't me polling people, hey, what kind of rules should we use to govern our society? That's not what this is. These did not come from a human leader, a power-hungry ruler who wanted a, a, a legislative code to keep people under control. And most importantly, the 10 words did not come out of a material, cold, lifeless universe. They come from the mind and the heart of the divine, and not just any divine. Not just God in some indistinct sense. You'll often hear people say, oh, I believe in God. I, I think there's a God. But if you force them, if you say, parse out, who is the God you're talking about? Suddenly it gets very squishy. Moses is doing something brilliant here. He's saying, before I, re before I remind you of the 10 words, I want to place squarely in front of you. I want to set in concrete the identity of the actual God that we're talking about. This is the God who appeared to Noah. This is the God who appeared to Abraham. This is the God who appeared to me out of a bush that was burning with an inextinguishable fire. And when I asked him what name I should use when I get into Egypt, and the people say, what is the name of the God who's come to deliver us? This is the God who said to me, I am who I am. Tell them, I am has sent you. That was his name. The I am, Yahweh. In other words, not just an all-powerful God, not just a ruling God, not just a God who makes demands, a God who shares his name. A God who shares his name is a personal God. A God who shares his name is a God who's initiating a relationship. Think about it. What's the very first thing you do when you want to start a relationship with someone? What do you tell them? You don't tell them your blood type. Hi, AB positive. What, AB negative? Great, we got a lot in common. No. You say, my name is, and you share your name. Do you realize how intimate that is to share your name with someone? It's relational. When I first saw Kathy Williams on the campus of Willamette University, 
I sort of watched her for a couple of months, just kind of sort of paid attention. Some people call that stalking. I, <laughs> I prefer the, the words admiring from a distance, which is what I did. And what I realized, I could learn a lot of things about Kathy. I figured out she was incredibly beautiful. I realized she was half Korean. I figured out she was an art major. But you know the one thing I wanted to know more than anything? I remember thinking, I wonder what her name is. Because the moment I know her name, it's like, well, I'm, I'm, and I, I also knew she was dating someone temporarily. And so I was like, I got to find out what her name is so I can get to work, okay? <laughs> when someone shares their name with you, they're inviting you into a, a relationship. And friends, can I tell you something? This should flip upside down your understanding of ethics. Because in the Bible... Doing right, being ethical, is not some cold, rigid, impersonal, sticking to a list of rules. It's a personal response to a personal God who's shared his personal name and has revealed to his people what he cares most about. Thank you. I'm going to email Pastor Charles and tell him you're still at it. The Decalogue is not just a list of rules. It's a gift of revelation. It's an expression of the heart and the character of God. And did you know that the people of Israel did not view God's law as a burden? Did you, did you know this? They did not view the law as a burden. They viewed it as an unbelievable, totally undeserved gift of God's grace to them. This is why the psalmist, you go to the psalms, they'll say, a psalmist will say, Yahweh, your Torah is so sweet to me. It's like honey on the tip of my tongue. Or it's so precious to me. It's more desirable than gold. We don't talk about the Old Testament like that, do we? But we should. A couple Sundays ago, Christopher preached in the beginning of chapter four, and I want to read you a section that he read. He preached it so well, but it's worth seeing again. This is, and don't turn there. I'm going to put it up. Listen to the way they thought about Torah. Moses said, see, I've taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should keep them in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them for that will be, look at this, that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Do you see that? Moses is saying, if you love God's law and you memorize it and you meditate it and you start living it out, people will look at your community and go, I see wisdom in that community. I see understanding and righteousness in that community. That's an amazing promise. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as Yahweh our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Oh, what we miss if we think of the 10 words as a list of rules. There are re they're portraits of the character of God. Let me give you an example. Why would one of the commandments be don't bear false witness? Don't be people who lie. Why? Because Yahweh is the God of truth. He is absolute truth and he's the source of all truth. And so if you're gonna be his people and you're in the world to image who he is, don't be a people who bear false testimony. Yahweh, the one and only God, is the God of life. He's the source of life. He's the author of the sanctity of life. So if you're gonna follow him in this world, don't be a people who commit murder. Yahweh is absolutely holy. There's no one like him. So commandment number three, do not take up his name in vain. It's a holy name. 
Yahweh is the one and only God. So commandment number one, there should be no other gods before you. What happens is if a community memorizes and loves and meditates and hides the teaching of the 10 words and the teaching of Jesus, I'll tell you about that more in a moment. We hide that in our hearts. What happens is we see the beauty of our God so clearly it begins to change the way we live. And people will notice. Amen? And so come back next week because we're going to dive in. I'm not done preaching. I'm just telling you, come back next Sunday. All right? That's just word one. Here's word number two. Look at verse two with me. The historical context in which the 10 words were given is absolutely critical. They don't just drop out of the sky and they don't come to us in a textual vacuum. They're given to us at a very specific moment in the biblical narrative. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. And that means if we don't understand what a covenant is, we're already off to a bad start in understanding the purpose of the 10 words. You won't understand why God gave the 10 words if you don't know what a covenant is. And we don't talk very much about covenants anymore, but we should because they are one of the most important themes in the Bible. Covenant is the primary way the Bible talks about our relationship with God. And it's the key to understanding the whole redemptive storyline. When you study the Bible, you realize there's all of these series of different covenants and they drive the narrative forward until we get all the way into the new covenant, the New Testament, where all of those covenants in the Old Testament find their fulfillment and full prophetic meaning in God's one and only Messiah, Jesus Christ. So, we need to slow down and go, what is a covenant? Now, pastors in the last few weeks have talked a lot about this, but I'm just gonna go all the way back to the beginning. I'm gonna put on the screen my attempt at the most succinct definition of a covenant. Here's what you need to know. A covenant is an invitation into a partnership, relationship, where God makes promises and he asks for loyalty. And you'll see this happening throughout the redemptive storyline. God comes to Abraham and he makes a covenant with Abraham. We call it the Abrahamic covenant where he says, I promise you, I'm gonna multiply you. Your offspring will be as many as the stars in the heavens and you will grow and you'll spread and you'll become a blessing to all the nations. And what happened? All God said was be loyal to me, Abraham. And Abraham broke the covenant. So God made another covenant with the people of Israel, with Moses as their mediator. We call that the Mosaic covenant, where God said, I'm gonna bless you. You're gonna be my people. I'm gonna give you my Torah, my 10, my 10 words. If you're loyal to me, you will be a light to the nations. The whole world will know that I'm God. And what did Israel do? They broke the covenant. So God made a covenant with David, a king. He thought, maybe if I can get a king on the throne. He made a covenant called the Davidic covenant where he said, David, I promise you one day, one of your seed will sit on a throne that will be a spiritual, eternal throne. He'll be the true Messiah king. His name will be Jesus and he will cause my kingdom to spread eternally and permanently. What did David do? He broke the covenant. And so Christ comes and the, and the Old Testament authors begin to speak of a new covenant, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, a covenant that's gonna be different. I'll tell you more about that later. Here's the thing you need to realize. Did you know, and think about this, both of the times that the 10 words show up, they're in the context of the covenant with Moses. They're in the Mosaic covenant a very specific context. They function like the stipulations of that covenant. God promises them at Sinai, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, I'll make you holy, I'll make you a kingdom of priests. And what is your part? Your part is the Decalogue. This is like 
the way I want you to relate to me. If you do this, this is the kind of relationship that we're supposed to have. This is your role in the partnership. The key is to realize the 10 words were given so that the people of Israel could partner with God to accomplish his mission. God knew if you learn these and you love these and you, med- and you meditate on these, you'll begin to live them out and people will look at you and they'll say, oh, so that's what God is like. I grew up in Oregon and I'm a child of the 80s, all right? You already know that because I referenced Raiders of the Lost Ark. But here's the thing. When I grew up in Oregon, there was a chain of restaurants in the Willamette Valley called Farrell's Ice Cream Parlors. Anybody heard of Farrell's? Okay, yeah, 80s people, thank you. We're all here. Okay, Farrell's were these really cool kind of late 1800s style ice cream parlors. And when you would walk into a Farrell's, the culture was, was very evident. You remember this? It was like customer service was rule number one. It was the, they were the, the, from, from top to bottom, from the dishwasher to the host to the, the waiters and waitresses, when you walked into a Farrell's, it was like you were the most important person on the planet. I got to meet Bob Farrell, the, the owner and founder, when I, in my days with Young Life because he was a friend of Young Life, and he told me the story about how all that came about. He had one commandment. He had one law that was posted in the restaurants that was like the rule for all the employees. And it was also the title of a book that Bob Farrell wrote. Does anyone want to try to take a guess what that commandment was? It's a little strange. So, okay, what what was it? Give them the pickle. I know, it's strange, all right? His rule was, this was in the restaurants, just give them the pickle. And there's a story, thank God. But anyway, the story is, a customer wrote a letter to Bob Farrell early on and said, I went to one of your restaurants and I ordered a hamburger and I asked for an extra pickle and the waiter said, I'll give you one, but it'll cost you $1.50. And I was like, $1.50? And Bob Farrell said, okay, from now on, folks, for heaven's sakes, just give them the pickle, all right? They'll come back later and spend a lot of money. What's the point? A really weird illustration? Yes, here's the real point. What if... The people who are employees in Farrell's took that literally and as a baseline. Like my job is just to make sure every customer gets a pickle. That would be like you and I treating the Ten Commandments like they're just these rules. As long as I do these things, I'm fine. Don't murder. I'm pretty good on that one. You know, don't commit adultery. I'm working on it, but I'm pretty good on that one. Like don't lie. I'm working on that. That's what we do. We turn the Ten Commandments into the baseline set of regulations. I do that. It doesn't really matter what I think about God or my relationship with God. And this is why, and I'm going to tell you in a minute, you know, Jesus said some really, really strong things about the Decalogue because he knew you guys totally missing the point You're missing the point. I'll get there in just a moment. But still, we have one more word. It's the word slavery. We look at your Bible, verse six. Verse six is the official beginning of the Decalogue. It's like the introductory statement And what it does, let me read it to you. What this statement does, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's the last word that you read and then you immediately begin reading the Decalogue. And what that does is it anchors the 10 words in a story, namely, Israel's liberation from slavery in Egypt. The 10 words were given to people who just three months before, now think about this, only three months before Mount Sinai, the people of Israel were groaning in political, economic, social, and spiritual bondage. And then three months later, they've been redeemed, they're on Mount Sinai, and what is the very first thing God does? 
He gives him the 10 words. And the reason I need you to see this is that what Moses is doing is he is creating a super important contrast out of slavery. Now, what am I gonna tell you? The 10 words. Moses is, he's saying Torah, law, the Decalogue, contrasted to slavery. Think about this. The law of God, the 10 words contrasted to bondage. Torah is not bondage. Law from God, it's not bondage. Just the opposite. Torah is given to people who are free. Folks, this is so important. Do you know what this is saying? Let me say it another way. The opposite of bondage is not freedom to do whatever we want. The opposite of bondage is a covenant relationship with God where in his grace he reveals to us how to live in that covenant. It's not freedom from God, it's freedom into relationship with God. This is so important because we're living in a culture where people think no one tells me what to do, especially not God. And you know what they're really describing? Slavery. When people think like that, they are in slavery. They are enslaved to themselves, which is the very worst person to be enslaved to. Amen? And so what does God do? He frees them. God's Torah was never meant to enslave. It was given to enhance a liberated life. Did you know seven times in the book of Exodus, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. Let my people go. He says it. Seven times, and we love that. We quote that all the time. We quote that on social media posts. We quote that when we care about justice. But it's interesting, we leave out the second part of the phrase. Do you know what it is? He would go to Pharaoh every time he would say, let my people go. Why? So that they can worship me in the wilderness. It's a vision of liberation, but it's not the kind of liberation our culture defines. Liberation means being freed from spiritual bondage in this world so that I can finally worship the one God who created me, who loves me, and who knows me. And so the 10 words were given to people to help them live liberated life. Amazing. Israel spent 400 years in slavery, and that means they had no sense of identity apart from being slaves to another people group. They had no culture. They had no, they had no story of traditions. They were completely at the mercy of another people group. They had no sense of up or down, right or wrong. What is the very first thing God does? He blesses them with a document that helps them make sense of how to live life as free people. 400 years you've lived under the the God Pharaoh who would not allow you to acknowledge your own creator God. What is the very first thing God says in the 10 words? I am Yahweh, your God. You'll have no other gods before me. 400 years as slaves, they never had a day of rest. What's the very first thing God does? Commandment number four. I want you to take, you're not slaves anymore. Take a day of Sabbath. Do you realize what a gift that was for especially the most marginalized in their society to be given a day of rest? 400 years, they were the victims of systematic genocide under bondage in Egypt. What does God say? You're not gonna be a people who murder. It was a gift. The 10 words are almost like the Bill of Rights for the newly formed nation of Israel. But here's the thing, unlike our Bill of Rights, which is very me-centric, right? Our Bill of Rights, it's all about me. 
The Decalogue is all about the rights of others. I'm gonna show you this next Sunday, but I want you to think about this. The first five commandments are all directed towards God. They're all about God's right to receive loyalty from me. And the second five words in the Decalogue are all about the rights of other people. They're about their rights to receive dignity and love from me. The Decalogue was so countercultural. It was all about putting other people first. Isn't that amazing? So significant. This is why I don't understand why in American culture, Christians spend time fighting over stuff like where we can put the 10 commandments up. We fight about posting the 10 commandments in schools and buildings. Now think about this. Is, so my, my problem with that is the number one problem in American culture is not that people don't obey the 10 commandments. The problem with American culture is that people are still in bondage in Egypt. That's the problem. They're slaves. Give them the 10 commandments as much as you want. They're not going to be able to obey them anyway without the power of the Holy Spirit and love for Jesus. We should be spending our time telling people we love you and Christ loves you. Amen. Because the Ten Commandments are for people who have been redeemed so they can know how to live the redeemed life. And they're worthy of our study and our love and our, and our meditation. But this is why Jesus said really harsh things to people whenever the Ten Commandments came up. I'm gonna close here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite the worship team to come. You know, Jesus said some interesting things about the Decalogue. Do you remember the moment when the, the young man came to Jesus and he said, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Remember the story? And this young man was wealthy and Jesus said, oh, it's simple. Just, just obey the commandments. You know the commandments. And Jesus lists some of them at the end of the list. Don't murder, uh, don't commit adultery, honor your mother and father, and, and you're good to go. And the man said, I've done all those. And then Jesus said, oh, oh, one other thing. Sell everything you've got and give it to the poor, right? And when people hear that, I've heard commentators say, oh, it's interesting. He left out the commandment about coveting. That must have been the man's real problem. But that's not what's happening here at all. Do you know what Jesus left out? He left out commandment number one. He was like, your problem is you're just trying to obey all this stuff down here, but you actually don't really care about the one true God. You have another God before God, Yahweh God, and that God is your money. And so Jesus said, you've misunderstood. This is why Jesus said, I've come not to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. I've come to bring in a new covenant. Now in this covenant, the commandments of God will no longer be written on tablets of stone I'll write them on the tablets of human hearts by the power of the Spirit. And so Jesus said, I can summarize the entire Old Testament in two phrases. Love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. Love God with all of your heart. That's commandments one through five. Come back next Sunday, I'll explain why. Love your neighbor as you. If you Jesus said, if you just do that, you'll fulfill all the 10 words anyway without even thinking about it. You just love God with all of your heart and you love your neighbor with everything you've got. The 10 commandments just seem to fall into place. So now we're under the law of Christ. We follow Christ. And we get to go to the 10 commandments to find out all the wisdom of God that built up to this moment when Jesus came to die on our cross and take our sins and rise again to bring new life. And so friends, it's a gift. It's a pleasure to study this and I hope you'll come back next Sunday. I'm gonna invite you to the table here and I'm gonna remind you that when Jesus initiated the Lord's Supper, he talked about the new covenant. He used the word covenant. And he said, we're in a new covenant now. This is the new covenant of my blood. It's a new way of relating to God. 
Now in this new relationship, I fulfilled the law completely for you. Then I hung on a cross to pay for all of your sin and disobedience. And then I poured out my Holy Spirit to change your heart and change your affections so that you could love God and obey him. And so we come to the table to eat in that meal and to get the strength to love and follow Jesus. So I'll invite you there in a moment. Will you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love your word. We love the wisdom. We love the truth. And most of all, Heavenly Father, we love your son, Jesus. If there's a reason why we call the old covenants old, it's not because they weren't filled with grace. It's because they didn't have the power to change a human heart. And Father, this morning, I know there are some sitting here right now who need a new heart. They don't need more rules. They don't need more ideas from the world. They don't need more motivational talks. They need a new heart. And the only one who has the power to do that is the spirit of the living God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so how I pray right now in this moment, God, you would soften hearts in this place. If you've come in and your heart was hard towards Christ and you've sensed the love of God for you, maybe this is the moment where God is drawing you into relationship with his son, Jesus. Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever considered it? It's the most simple, heartfelt prayer. You simply say, God, I believe what I've heard today about sin, my sin, and I believe what I've heard about Jesus and his death and resurrection. And I wanna follow Christ. Would you forgive me of my sins this morning, Father? Pray that prayer over the next few moments and then go to the communion table as a follower of Jesus. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We pray this together in your perfect name. Everybody said... Amen.